a change. I mean, I did feel, when I got elected to the um, Royal Society of Edinburgh, I did feel like a complete fraud. Because I was sitting in a lecture theatre and people kept going out the front to get their, you know, to be, become fellows. And it was people who were inventing things and people who were trying to cure cancer and people who were doing important work overseas. And then there was this guy who sits and tells lies for a living. And that was me, you know, just making stuff up. And suddenly I'm going, I don't, I shouldn't be here. It must be a mistake. Very flattering though. It is. Very flattering. How many of you here watch CSI? Come on, be honest. Oh, shame on you. <laughs> How many of you have seen this programme that's even worse, called Bones? Oh, double shame on you. <laughs> We're going to, to talk this evening um, about the interaction between science and writing. Um, we'll do that for a little bit because I suspect what we really want to do is put the microphone out there to the audience because I'm sure there are things that you want to ask Ian and that's probably what we'll spend much of the evening doing. But we do need to talk a little bit about science and it's very interesting what was said at the outset about how important it is to enthuse young people. Well, you know, the modern 60 is the old 40, don't they say? And they do say that you're only as old as... No, we won't go into that one. No, we won't go into that one. And we just run a MOOC, which is called a Massive Open Online Course on Forensic Science, and we did a murder mystery. Someone got murdered on the top of the law in Dundee, something that happens fairly frequently in Dundee. Um, and we had 21,500 people on this Massive Open Online Course. Our youngest was 12, because that's the age limit that we have to put on it. The top end of that was what really matters to us more than anything, and she was 91. And there is no limit to learning, and that's the most important thing. Whilst it's great to enthuse our young folk, let's not forget us folk in the middle, let's not forget us folk heading towards that other end as well, because age is not something that, that dims your enthusiasm, dims your ability to learn. And I think the partnership that we find between forensic science, which is a, an understandable science. The, the science goes on in my building. Now, I don't even understand the title. Whatever ubiquitination is of proteins, I think, I've no idea. And it's difficult to engage with that kind of science. When the kind of science we do links into the kind of writing that somebody like Ian does, then I think you get a magic you get something that can capture everybody's imagination, regardless of whether you're 12 or you're 91. Is that true? I would think so. I mean, I would hope that's true. Um, I do think, I mean, you know, the people who put their hands up because they watch CSI or they watch Bones, <laughs> probably, I mean, there's a lot of people out there who probably think they, they know it all now. They've watched it on the TV and the TV must be right because it's on the TV and it sounds right. It sounds like it's all, all right. And I'm, you know, we, we know scientists, people who work in this profession, who would watch that and just laugh at these beautiful glass walled, you know, sort of offices with all the latest high spec equipment and nobody sitting there going, no, you can't afford to do that piece of work. Well, yeah. that machine's not working. Oh, that machine's not working or yeah. we can't, you know, we've not paid the electric bill this week, so let's not go there. Um, but you know, real police forces and, and real forensics, there's always a cost involved in investigation. And of course, that'd be very tedious if half of CSI was just them going through the bills and going, well, I'm sorry, I know you've got a severed ear there, uh, but we can't do anything with that this week because we've got no money. Um, um, but so there's that kind of, there's, there's a sense that the public know more than it, they've ever known about what goes on behind the scenes because TV programs especially have this patina of realism. Mm. You know, the people are, are, are using the right slang words, the right technical language, they're dressed the right way for going to a crime scene or whatever. But it's always, always at the heart of that is telling a story and if there needs to be a shortcut because the storytelling is involved, there will be a shortcut. In CSI, they always solve the case in 42 minutes <laughs> because 42 minutes is how long they're on That's screen. Good. But this stuff can go on for weeks, months and years. Um, and, and sometimes what crime is waiting for is for the science to come along that can catch the killer. For example, with the World's End murders, we had to wait an awful long time for the DNA, um, the ability for DNA analysis to give you something that you could actually take to court. Couldn't have been done no. in 1977 um, when the murders actually happened. 
not even, not even a chance. But what's amazing is the police kept everything. They kept the clothing, they kept the bits of rope, they kept everything in a, in a, in a way that meant that later on it could be produced and was valid in court. Part of our, our problem is that forensic science, the forensic bit comes from Latin, which means pertaining to the forum, the forum where the courts of Rome. So everything that a, a forensic scientist does is geared towards the courtroom. It's not geared towards the police or an investigation. It's about the courtroom. And the triers of fact in our courtroom are you. It's, it's the public. And so when, as a scientist, you go into court and you have to try to explain your science in a way that's understandable, often what I say may be very different to what somebody, not like you, because you don't, you don't include a huge amount of forensic science in the way that you write, but other crime writers do. And the public are, they are swayed by what is written in fiction. And so as a real scientist, you have this constant battle that's going on between, can you please not write that? Because I know that you know, two million people are going to read your book, and I know that at least three of them are going to end up in my jury. <laughs> and they're going to go, oh, that's not what Ian Rankin says. It can't possibly be true. <laughs> and as the, as the sort of expert witness, you, you find yourself pitted against the likes of a crime writer. And there, there is a responsibility, I think, on the scientist to make sure that we make our science as understandable in the court as possible. We had a lovely, um, we did a, a public engagement event in Dundee and it was funded to reach hard to reach communities, the kind of communities that wouldn't normally interact with the university and wouldn't normally come into science. And of course it's Dundee so you do a murder. Um, and everybody felt completely at home with that. And so we did the murder mystery, and we had the most wonderful quote that we, we almost, if we'd paid for it, it couldn't have got any better. And it was a lady who said that um, she had been involved in a trial as a juror, and it was a serious case, it was a rape case. And she said, we came back with a not proven verdict, because we, we didn't quite understand what was going on. And she said, by the time I'd finished the course, I'd have come back with a different verdict. Now that's really worrying, but that really worries me because that says the public can be swayed by having a bit more realistic knowledge of the science. Do crime writers have a responsibility to write good science and realistic science, or is it that it, it's a fiction, that there is no responsibility on them at all? Um, I think that's up to each individual writer. I mean, I think some writers would feel they had a responsibility and other writers would feel that what it was all about was narrative and storytelling and, that, and they were just continuing a tradition of, of storytelling where sometimes the facts get in the way and they're inconvenient facts. I mean, for example, there's an awful lot of stuff that would happen in a murder inquiry in a, in a, um, uh, in a forensic lab or in a pathology um, suite um, that would just get, you know, that would slow the action down in a book to the extent that you get really bogged down. The reader could get really bogged down. And when I found out early on in my career, because when I wrote my first crime novel, I was a student, I didn't know anything about process at all. But and, you know, fairly early on, I found out what there's, there's, there's corroboration all the way through Scots law, which means there's got to be two pathologists. Maybe not for much longer. Maybe not for much longer, that's true, but two pathologists, and I'm going, well, that's two characters where really I only need one to tell the story. And suddenly there's got to be someone else in the room who's just dead meat as far as the storytelling aspect goes. Nice. <laughs> no, no. nice. <laughs> but just meet in the room, you know? Nice. I, <laughs> so I kind of, I mean, I sort of, I take that on board, but I just think, that, oh, it's a real pain. It's a pain that the, 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 the realism should get in the way of that. And then I think, you know, there's only about, I don't know, maybe you know, a handful of people who would read my books who would notice that, who would be annoyed by it. And most folk wouldn't. I remember when, you know, Rebus had to move police stations because they'd been told by a cop that the real police station where he worked, St. Leonard's, was no longer going to have a CID. So I shifted him and my publisher said, why? And I said, because there's about 20 people who would know that there's no longer a CID there and that would annoy them. And then they didn't shut down the CID after all. <laughs> but you know, all this stuff that's happened with Police Scotland. Yeah. I don't know. Do, do, I mean, do, honestly, these people at the top of Police Scotland, do they never think of the crime writers? <laughs> how, how do you write longevity into, or, or do you look at longevity into a story? 
So, you know, um, if, if you were writing something just before the referendum, for example, would, would you fit something that is, is a pivotal historical moment into a book? Does it date it? It does date it. I mean, it definitely dates it. Does that it. matter? I don't think it matters too much. I mean, the, the, the early, my early books could stand as historical documents, you know. No mobile phones, no laptops, very few computers available to the police. Um, Rebus has to stop his car at a telephone box to make a phone call. The fax machine is a new thing. Everybody's excited about getting a fax. Sounds like Dundee. Really? <laughs> but you know, a few years later on, that was all gone. That was all, that was all dead in the water and new technology had come along. So the technology dates very quickly and it seems like it's d dating even quicker now. Yeah. Um, but in some ways, you know, crime is very much, crime's an old story. Crime goes way back to the beginnings of storytelling. I mean, it's kind of, it goes back to myth and legend. It goes back to folk tale and fairy tale. Um, you know, Red Riding Hood is a, is a classic crime story. Um, just because somebody looks right doesn't mean they are right. There could be a wolf in your granny's clothing, as it were. And there's an awful lot of that, and crime fiction is very much about very basic um, questions that an, o that an audience has always wanted to gnaw on. You know, why do we keep doing bad things to each other? I mean, through history, people have wanted to keep asking that question to try and work out what it is about human beings that makes us so, you know, the possibility for us to be nasty as well as nice. And that's something that we don't need forensics for that or anything else. That's a very basic piece of storytelling. But since I am writing about a professional cop, and the books do exist in something close to real time, um, that is problematic. That, you know, Rebus is now 65. Uh, in fact, he's probably a wee bit older than that, but I've kind of slowed the clock down a bit. So he's had to retire again in the new book that comes out next month. He's, he's gone. He's a consulting detective. So there's only so much I can do with a 65-year-old consulting detective that's realistic or even semi-realistic. Do you know, I don't, I don't know that's necessarily true anymore because certainly when, when you speak to the police forces right and up, up and down the length and breadth of the country, they are retiring very early. Um, they're going out into the world in a different job and we're losing so much experience from the police forces mm -hmm. that they are coming back <coughs> and then they, they keep coming back because that experience eventually people do realise have a, has a value. Yeah, I think, I think the thing is that the upper echelons of the Scottish police wouldn't want Rebus coming back necessarily. <laughs> he's not the kind of cop they like. Um, he's, he's the kind of cop who should be getting investigated by internal affairs more than has been his want in uh, previous books. But no, I mean, so I think that, that longevity thing, I didn't think about it when I started the books. You know, the first Rebus novel was meant to be the only Rebus novel. And so I didn't think about it at all. And it was only really when it became a series. Well, I mean, two things. One, when it became a series, I thought, and I was making money from it, I thought, oh, well, then I owe it to the professions I'm talking about to actually properly find out what they do. Because my first novel, um, which I wrote when I was a student, I... Um, I wrote to the, I have no idea how the police works. I wrote to the chief constable of Lothian and Borders Police. Did he reply? Fettis Avenue. His secretary replied. And his secretary yes. said, go to Leith Police Station and talk to these two detectives and they will answer your questions. And I went, great. So I headed off down there, looking like a tramp. And um, these two very smartly dressed detectives came out to talk to me and they, they said, you're writing a book, you know, young tramp man. And, uh, because it was like second-hand clothes from Oxfam shops and stuff, and a Doctor Who scarf and all that, and it was middle of winter, you know. And um, what's your book about? And I gave him the plot of Knots and Crosses, and um, not realising that it was almost identical to something that had just happened, and Leith Police Station was the kind of where they were doing in, where the inquiry was based. So they, they managed to haul a computer into an interview room and sat me down at the wrong end of it and said, we'll ask you a few questions. Let's, let's pretend that you're a suspect in an ongoing police. I had no idea. Let's pretend you're a suspect in an ongoing police investigation. Name, date of birth, address, occupation. What are you doing the night of the 5th of October? And I'm going, 5th of October? I've not got a Scooby pal, it's probably out in the lash. You know, you wake up next morning, you can't remember. Yeah, yeah, just give us some, you know. An hour and a half. I was answering their questions, and that was it. I was put in the system. I went home that weekend, told my dad. I told my dad that story. Went, you silly bugger. Yeah. They thought you did it because I had. This was a. Um, what was her name? She went missing from a fun fair in Portobello, um, and then there were six more victims after her, and it was a guy called Robert Black. Yeah. Um, but it was that case. But at this time, it was just a missing persons case, and in Knots and Crosses, children are being abducted and killed, and so. I'd kind of stumbled into it and I became a suspect. So that's why I didn't go near the police for years after that. Because <laughs> I didn't want to become a suspect in a police inquiry again. Thank is you very much. There, is there a risk when you're writing that, that it does 
gel with, with a community, with a population that is going through something like that of its time. So, you know, we do have, right the way throughout the year, we have key cases that come up, we see them in the courtrooms. Is, is that something that as a writer you try to avoid or is it something that you can use? If it's a type of case that's coming up, I might be thinking, well, what's that, what does that say about us? Mm -hmm. What does that say about us as a culture, as a society, as a country, that this kind of thing is happening? And that might, I might then explore that as a possible plot theme for a book. I have occasionally actually used real cases. I mean, I use Bible John in black and blue um, without thinking, Christ, they might come after me if he's still out there. Um, when I thought that, I thought maybe I shouldn't have written the book. And I've, I used a, um, a war crimes suspect, and he was actually living in Edinburgh, an old, you know, an old German who was living in Edinburgh and uh, had, was suspected of being a war criminal. And then he, luckily he died before he could sue me. Um, natural causes. And um, <laughs> when they found an old, they found, what was it they found in, in where the Scottish Parliament is now, which was Queensbury House, which mm -hmm. was an old hospital. And when they were sort of rejigging it, they, they, they told me the story of the act of cannibalism that took place there um, uh, centuries ago, where a Duke of Queensbury's nephew had killed a servant and eaten them on the day that Scotland and England joined together. And this was seen as a very bad omen and the Duke of Queensbury or whatever was chased through the streets. I just thought, great idea, I'm gonna put that in a book. Um, so I've done that occasionally and things like, you know, asylum seekers in Glasgow, when we started getting asylum seekers and when they were getting, you know, kids were getting locked up, kids of asylum seekers were getting locked up and not getting any um, proper schooling and stuff. I mean, these have all drip fed into the books. Um, because the books are trying to say something about us and who we are and what, you know, what, why does this stuff happen and, and you know, how do we feel about that? How do the readers feel about the stuff that this stuff happens in our very midst? But of course, if it's a real case, you can get in trouble. And things like, you know, I thought about Lockerbie for a long time. And cause I'd, I'd spoken to um, Professor Anthony Buzatil amongst others and cops who were there and he was there on the day, other people who were there on the day. There were a lot of really interesting stories to be told about that that told us a lot about the people involved, the people who came afterwards and were having to deal with it in their heads, you know, having to deal with the fact that they were finding bodies that had fallen out of the sky everywhere. And what that does to you, I just thought that's a really interesting thing to do, but I couldn't do it. It was just too raw. It was too raw and I couldn't do it. Um, and, you know, it was been a, there was a paedophile case and I, tr I thought I was going to do it from the paedophile's point of view, couldn't do it. Um, an act of moral cowardice, I would suggest, Sue. I, couldn't, I didn't want to go inside the head of a paedophile. Mm. We, of course, do. So there's a lot of, of work that we do in relation to, to paedophiles. Um, and it's a, it's a strange fact of science that we think of science as being very much a, a laboratory-based new thing that is forensic science. But the basis of what we do in terms of our, our approach to identifying paedophiles is very anatomically based. And our best anatomists were from the 1500s in terms of Vesalius. We, we've known as much as we ever needed to know about anatomy then as we know now. So I challenge you, look at the back of your right hand. Look at the vein pattern on the back of your right hand. Now look at the vein pattern on the back of your left hand. On Ian Rankin's life, I'll bet they don't match. If you're a redhead and you've got a an MR1 gene. I bet the freckle pattern on your right hand doesn't match your left hand. I bet the scars you've got in your right hand that you use with a kitchen knife aren't on your left hand. The pattern of the skin over your knuckles will be different on every single finger and right across both of your hands. Anatomy's known that since the 1500s. And paedophiles, it is one of the most horrific and really heinous crimes that you can imagine on society, <coughs> preying upon the vulnerable. And it's one of the few crimes where the perpetrator actually films themselves committing the crime. And there are various parts of the perpetrator that can come into the image, but frequently it's their hands. And we were involved in a case in London, and it was a, a very brave young girl, a young teenage girl, who alleged she was being abused by her biological father. And I don't know if you know it, but if you leave your Skype camera on, on your laptop overnight, it clicks into infrared mode and you can see at night. 
and she left her, her Skype camera on. And at half past four in the morning, we see an arm just coming into view in the camera. It's one of the spookiest things I think I've ever seen and interferes with the young girl. And under infrared light, it interacts with the deoxygenated blood in your veins and your veins stand out like black tram lines. So we get a beautiful pattern of your veins. We can compare the vein pattern then on the suspect with the vein pattern on the accused and on the perpetrator, I should say. And in this case, he was found not guilty. And we were horrified. And we said, what do we do wrong with the science? And we asked our lawyer to go back and talk to the courtroom, to the jury. And they said, no, 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 we had no problem with the science. We just didn't believe the girl. She didn't cry enough. She wasn't upset enough. So it doesn't matter sometimes, even if your science is good. Um, sometimes in the courtroom, you still can't win. But that science, that, that little link into science, allowed us to, to really start to do the research that's required. And you can get an idea from a case, but then what you have to do is to research it. And to research it, what you need is a database. And you need a database that you can go and say, how frequently does this happen? So right the way throughout 2007, 2009, we had about 550 police officers come through Dundee as we trained the national team in disaster victim identification. And what we persuaded almost all of them to do was to strip down to their underwear. And we photographed them, every part of their body just about, hands and feet and legs and thighs and backs and fronts and everything, under visible light and under infrared light, which gave us a tremendous database. And it means now we're in a position five years forward that we couldn't have done five years ago that we can say with a, a degree of certainty what the variation is. So what is the likelihood of two people having that same vein pattern? What is the likelihood of people having those scars in the same place? What is the likelihood of those freckle patterns? And 82% of the cases that come to us now on paedophiles being identified from images result in a change of plea. And that's really important because what that does is it saves the courtroom a tremendous amount of money but what it also means is that the children are protected from having to go and give evidence in court against their dad, their granddad, their mum's boyfriend, whoever it may be. And that becomes a really social, socially important part. So I understand why you don't want to go into the heads of, of these kinds of people. We don't have that choice and we have to go into those areas. And some of the most horrendous things that I think I've ever seen in my career have been in video clips from cases such as that. Do you feel, I mean, when you take all this stuff, this kind of stuff into court and you come up against one of these smarmy lawyers? Oh, been there. <laughs> Anybody I mean, ever must, been that, up against Donald Finlay? <laughs> I mean, that, that must drive you, is he in the audience tonight? No, he's not. <laughs> I, like, I know Donald well. He's at, he's at a Rangers game. <laughs> um, yeah. Or a Cowden Beef game. He's from Cowden Beef, did you know that? He's from yeah, he went Beath to Dundee. Oh, <laughs> he's from Cowden Beef. Um, anyway, um, I went to school in Cowden Beef. Um, no, I mean, honestly, it's because you can have all the, all the fantastic science and everything, and you've done everything, and you're ready to go, and you get into that courtroom, and a lawyer can act, they're great actors, and they can persuade a jury mm. that don't listen to that la-la-la-la-la-la-la, listen yeah. to me. That's really frustrating, it's really hard. And you've got to bear in mind that when you go into court, um, the, first, the first bit that you do in court is the person who's usually on your side, because we're usually there for the crown. So the first bit of the day is easy. The cross-examination comes when you've already been standing for five hours, and you're tired, and you just want to go home. And that's when you've got the defence lawyer, usually. Although we do do defence work as well. And it's very, very difficult to keep that coolness, that detachment, that unbiased scientific approach that you need to have all the way through the day when you've been standing solidly almost for seven hours and the tough bits coming right at the end. And it, it isn't, you, you can't take it personally, although it's really hard not to, but you can't, it's what they're doing. And I can remember a case that we did, it was a lady who went missing in Helensboro and we found just a tiny bit of her skull inside the filter of a washing machine, long story. Um, and Donald Finlay was the defence lawyer and so, you know, I've done my bit to the crown, I'm feeling fine. And Donald, of course, with big mutton uh, sideburns, sort of leans underneath the desk and he pulls out great drama, 
drops the new edition of Grey's Anatomy on the table in front of me. And he says, now, Professor, I don't doubt you for a moment. And you know exactly what's coming. And he says, I'm sure you know this book better than I do. I'd never seen that edition of Grey's Anatomy. But whilst there is showmanship, he spent the next four hours cross-examining me on how that bone forms, what it's like in the child, what it's like in the adult, how it fractures. So whilst there is a tremendous amount of, of acting, there is a huge amount of skill mm -hmm. in the defence lawyer and in the prosecution lawyer as well. And so for us, it's really challenging when you're in that courtroom because you're not just dealing yeah, yeah. with someone who's acting, you are dealing with someone who's done their research as yeah. well. Yeah, but you just want to jump up and say, look, it was in the bloody washing machine. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it's hers. Yeah. You know. What does it matter? But none of this matters. Well, Don't I, it. Had, I had a dismemberment case. I had a dismemberment case. Yeah, um, are we okay with this? <laughs> <laughs> Down south. And, and you try really hard to be this professional in court. And you try to be very sensible about it. And this guy, he was a, what was called a cutter. And the cutters are professional dismemberers. So if you're looking for a new career, you can work for a drug gang in London as a cutter. And your job is that when they've, they've tortured somebody, they've murdered them, it comes around the back of the nightclub. And his job is to dismember. And so the dismemberment was done with the most incredible skill. What he didn't do was he didn't do the second part of the process terribly well, which was the dumping. And you had to pay £2,000 to the dumper to get rid of the bits. So he thought he'd save money. So he did a great job on the cutting, but did a lousy bit in the dumping because the body was found two days later. And when I was in court, they said, um, you know, wouldn't you need terribly sharp knives to do this? And I went, well, no, as long as you know what you're doing, you don't. Yes, but these aren't the kind of knives that you'd find in a kitchen. I said, well, yeah, you'd find them in my kitchen. And the lawyer went, oh, I'm not coming round to yours for dinner. <laughs> and you think, should I laugh? Should I not laugh? I'm in court. I, I, I can't do that. And it, sometimes they do catch you completely off guard. And I think that's part of the act as well. Mm -hmm. So it can be a, it can, it can be a funny <coughs> place in courtroom. I remember when, when, you know, having had my nasty run-in with the police with my first t attempt at research, a few years later, a cop did come up to sign in and he said, oh, you make a few mistakes in your books, and procedural mistakes. And I said, oh, I can't go near you guys, you know, otherwise I might become a murder suspect again. And he became a friend, still is, and he helped me a lot. He would introduce me to people, show me case notes and such like, explain how things worked. Um, and then I needed, I, needed, I needed a pathologist. I needed to ask a few questions about drowning um, for a book. And he said, oh, talk to Tony Buzatil at the university. He's the pathologist, he's the guy to talk to. So I wrote to him and I got an appointment and I turned up and his secretary said, oh, he's, he's teaching, but he'll be here in a wee bit. Just go and sit in his office. And I went and sat and there was just a big A4 brown envelope on the desk. And I sort of sat. And eventually Tony comes bustling in and all my questions went out of my head because he's about, yay high. Yeah, yep. And Danny, Danny DeVito, dead yeah. ringer, right? And I'm just thinking, how does he reach the slab? He has a box. He has a box. Has I know a box. that he has a box. He has a I thought, box. really low slab, maybe on somebody's shooters. <laughs> anyway, so he comes bustling around and he says, he said, I'm sorry to keep you, sorry to keep you. So you can see from the photographs that the neck is, the head's been severed almost completely from the body. You can see it's a serrated, probably a serrated knife. You can see it. And he looked at me and he went, oh, sorry, you're not Detective Sergeant Brown? I went, no. He said, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All this stuff went back in the drawer again. And that was my introduction to you know, pathology, pathology 101. And, uh, but he was great. He said, do you want to come and see the, see the, the mortuary? And you know, he took me around the mortuary and stuff. Do you want to see a, a, a post-mortem examination? I said, no, not really. Um, I mean, just, did you? No, I didn't. I didn't. I mean, it was enough for me to see where it happens. Okay. You know, seeing where it happens and watching Silence of the Lambs, I was fine. I mean, you know, I mean, I've got, I had a few textbooks and texts where you go, can I write, okay, that's what happens. Um, but if I had a question, he was always brilliant. Um, you know, I mean, a specific one like drowning, how do you know if somebody's been dead when they go in the water or not? I mean, these days a lot of folk know that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know it at the time. And I think the, in the internet must have still been in its infancy. I think these days there's a kind of lazy tendency Very much so. to think yeah. I can just go to Wikipedia or I can Google it and I'll have an absolutely concrete mm. answer. And that's a dangerous way to do research. You've got to bear in mind as well that what the Defence Council do is they Google you. So if you're an expert witness, they will Google you to find out what you did last 
or if there's anything out there on Facebook, which I don't do for a very good reason, that, you know, is there a photograph of you blind blazing drunk on the, on the sidewalk or whatever it may be? Um, and you've got to bear in mind, they, they will check you out. Whereas the, that could never have happened before. Now you're in the scrutiny in the courtroom that says, oh, you didn't do so well in your last case, did you? I think, really? Wow, that's scary. And you were saying earlier that, that, um, that, that Bones is perhaps not as factually exacting okay, as it could be. Okay, let me explain why it's not factual. Okay, no, 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 one episode, okay? One episode explains everything you ever need to know about Bones. And it was an episode that was given to my students to, to critique. And I, by the time I could get them off the floor because they were rolling around laughing, <laughs> um, it was they'd found a, baby, a newborn baby's skeleton. Okay, and they have this wonderful three-dimensional reconstructive hologram bit of equipment. Doesn't exist. Okay, <laughs> so they took the baby's skull. Okay, they aged it. They did a facial reconstruction on it, and when they walked out of the room, they walked straight into a woman that looked exactly like the baby. Yeah. Now the reason I brought that up. The reason I brought that up is because that apart, <laughs> Kathy Rice is actually pretty good when she does her, her, um, her, her other books, her Tempe Brennan books. Yes. Because she's a... Cause she's a forensic anthropologist. Yeah, she's a forensic anthropologist. Her heroine's a forensic anthropologist. And, the, 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 and, and it's not... Th that stuff is not, I think, sensationalised. I mean, there is some, some of the... You know, some other writers have sensationalised the way that um, a pathologist or a forensic anthropologist might work. Yeah. <laughs> Case got better. But she is, you know, I think the details there and it's not sensationalised because she actually lives it and works it. I mean, in her day job, that's what she does. Kathy is very funny because being in the same profession, I've, I've known her for a long time. And she sent me a, a first copy of her book, her first one, which was called Deja Dead. And um, she let me read it. And I, I tend not to read crime novels. Um, and she said to me, what did you think of it? And, and I was very polite. I said, it's, it's really not for me. It's not my kind of thing. And she said to me, she said, normally should I be really upset by that, but they've just paid me a million dollar retainer to write the second. So I really don't care what you think <laughs> at all. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that's fair. That's fair <laughs> it's comment. absolutely fair. I think the first one wasn't the best. Um, Tempe put herself in dangerous positions <laughs> that I think realistically she wouldn't have done. But you know, the science is, I always believe science the science there. and I always yeah. believe the way that that character acts as part of a case. Mm. OK, she sometimes stumbles into trouble and all the rest of you think, that seems to happen over and over again with you. How would that be possible? Um, but the actual science, I think, is good. Um, I mean, are there any other writers that, I mean, I know you said you don't read much crime fiction, but is there anybody you think of those where the science is right, is spot on? Um, I, I've had the privilege over the last few years to actually work with quite a lot of crime writers. Um, very kindly, they, they got together as a group to support me in a project called Million for a Morgue, which was raising a million pounds to build a mortuary in Dundee, which we did. Um, and I spent a lot of time then obviously working with Val McDermott and with Stuart McBride, but also with Geoffrey Deaver and, and a few others. And I've always been incredibly impressed at just how much care and attention they take in terms of science. So, for example, um, Stuart was writing one fairly recently, I don't know if it's out yet, because I don't read them, so I don't know, um, which involved a dismemberment. And what he didn't know was how it felt. So our, our dissecting room happens to be named after Stuart McBride, because he raised a lot of money for us. And so I said, why don't you come into the dissecting room that you helped us build? And you can see... Well, he'd see not been in before. He'd never been in. And I've never seen him so nervous in my life going in there. And it's like our students, for the first 10 minutes, they are incredibly nervous. And then when you see what is the absolute marvel that is the human body, you forget to be scared of it, because it is just the most wonderful construction you could imagine. And so for him, it was about being able to feel what does cartilage feel like? He was okay with what bone feels like, but what does cartilage feel like? What does dead skin feel like? What does muscle feel like? And, and for me, somebody who wants to put themselves into that sort of a position, to be able to write about it, then I think that that's, that's good research. Val is, is shameless 
Absolutely, well, many things, Val is shameless. <laughs> um, but she's shameless because she'll phone up and she'll just say, oh, I'm just phoning to find out how you are, what you're doing. And you know she's on a fishing trip. She wants to find out what your latest case is because she wants to nick the science that's going on so that it will appear in her book before it appears in any of my papers that are published. <laughs> um, so and then she'll so say she you stole it from her. Yeah. Oh, so, you know, you read a Beauval book and you go, oh, yeah, I recognise that one. Oh, yeah, and I recognise that one. So the stories <laughs> end up in there. But, but that in itself is fine because I think if, if the science is going to be there, then it, it should be reported well. And I'd rather there was good science and I'd rather spend the time with crime writers explaining something to them than to see something go out that, that is not believable. And I think that, that's, that's, a, that's a duty as well that they take very seriously, as you do, to the people for whom you write. Hmm that, you know, it should be believable. Yeah, and if you're making a good living from writing about real professions, you probably should get the facts of the jobs right, or as right as you possibly can get them. Um, I, mean, I, I mean, a lot of older cops used to tell me, oh, there was this terrible pathologist, and he would, if it was your first time in a dissecting room, he would always try and make you faint, make you run out and vomit, you know, they'd be doing stuff they wouldn't really need to do, peeling skulls back and pulling faces back and dissecting penises and you name it, they would do it just watching the young cop and just say, can we keep going? You know, you're going to keep going, you're going to keep going. There was one, there was a pathologist so who remain nameless, yeah. and re to re absolutely remain nameless in London, who used to keep a tally board. And so every time a, a, a policeman hit the floor, you'd get the tally board. Um, yeah. Wouldn't happen these days though, right? No, it absolutely wouldn't happen these days. It can't. There's been a huge change in culture in relation to what goes on within a dissection. I mean, I can remember when, when I first started in this, and it was back in the 1980s, we were able to go into the mortuary and take any samples of anything that we, that we needed for research purposes. And quite rightly now, you can't do that. And I can remember Ian West, who's a pathologist, who's, who's sadly deceased now, telling me the story about how they were able to, this is not funny, but it, it is, but it's not funny, is that they were doing some research on aging bones, so they were taking out sections of the thigh bone. And what they would do is they'd put a doweling bit of wood inside so that you know the legs would be back to the same length when you, you sewed the body back up again. All perfectly legit to do. The body, unfortunately, then was going into um, a particular area of London that had a high-rise flats. And the only way to get the body up onto the 30th floor was on the lift. So it meant that the coffin went from being horizontal to being vertical. And of course, when they opened the coffin, all you had were two bits of wood sticking out of the front of the thighs, and there was a huge explanation had to be done in relation to that. But that was permissible. And there's so much that changes, quite rightly changes. I can remember in our anatomy department in London, we would have glass bottles full of babies, stillborn babies, um, aborted fetuses, and that was research that was done on that. That was acceptable. And time changes, and you have to keep changing with it, so that when the dinosaurs do come back, the likes of Rebus, into these sort of situations, the culture has changed. Mm -hmm. And you've either got to change with the culture, or you come into conflict with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Surgeons Hall in Edinburgh, I don't know if they still do or not, but they used to have, they used to call it a black museum, and it was just full of kind of grisly things in bottles and jars. And somebody had the job of topping up the formaldehyde. Mm. Uh, weekly or monthly, I thought that was a hell of a job that. Um, but yeah. now, I think they've now opened it up to the public in they general. Have. I think and it's beautiful. Can go. It's beautiful. Yeah, they've done, done, yeah. done, yeah. done a new job. They, they had a similar uh, museum in London, and the one that always struck me was well, why you would do it, but I don't know. It was a suicide, and it was a chap who tried to commit suicide with a circular saw. And he didn't get it right the first time. So that what you have is the first cut that wasn't successful, and then the second cut that was. Why is that in a museum? No idea. It's horrid, absolutely horrid. No but idea. times change about what's acceptable and what isn't. Well, there's a Hunterian Museum in London, which is fascinating because it's a Dr. Hunter who was a Scottish guy and his, his brother was also a doctor called Hunter and has a Hunterian Museum in Glasgow. Yeah. But the one in London, I mean, he was, a, he was based in Leicester Square, I think it is now. And some people think he was the template for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde um, because he consorted with body snatchers. Yeah. And um, his wife was a socialite, so she'd be having Haydn, the composer, around for drinks, and then round the back, the chap at the door, and they were bringing new bodies in and stuff. And he tried all kinds of medical experiments. He tried growing teeth on coxcombs, he tried all kinds of transplants and things. Um, but it was all done in the name of science. And what always fascinated me was that Burke and Hare, the body snatchers who weren't body snatchers, they decided to cut out the middleman and just kill people and pretend they yeah. dug the bodies up, that they led to the Anatomy Act. Yes. Before that, the only people you were allowed to do scientific research on 
were people who were convicted murderers who'd been hanged yep. because they weren't going to go to heaven anyway. Um, because of the, the public's outrage with that, we got the Anatomy Act, which meant people could leave their bodies to science and science, you know, scientific research could be it, brought forward. It got eventually to the point that people could leave their body to science, but there was a bit in between. So that there was a knee-jerk reaction amongst the public that said, this is not right, that, that granny's body can get stolen or that my son can get murdered to do this. We need to legislate against these anatomists. They were really surgeons, not the anatomists. Um, and so that legislation was brought in to stop doing that. But what they then did was that they realised that there was still a need for cadavers. And what they did was they said, well, where do we find them? And you find them in the poor houses, the prisons and the mental institutions. And so the Anatomy Act shifted the dissection from the murderer to the poor. And there was another outcry that the poor said, well, hold on a minute, you are equating us to murderers. And there, there was a, the, the, the amount of bodies available eventually started to dry up because we did away with poor houses. Mm -hmm. People were living in prisons because of our, our health conditions. So we've always had this problem in anatomy of where do you get bodies from? And one of the, the things that happened was that we had two world wars. And in those two world wars, what we had was, was a tremendous outpouring of support and so for those people who couldn't go away and fight, you could still do your bit at home, you could still donate your body. That meant that surgeons, the doctors could all learn so that your grandson who's out in the battlefield has got a better chance of survival. And the bequeathal, the whole aspect of bequeathal, really took off in the wars. And we've never had really the same volume of bodies bequeathed to us that we had at the Second World War, at the end of the Second World War. Yeah. So that, that act of leaving your remains was actually quite late. Jeremy right. Bentham was the one who was the only one who really pushed that forward, but at the time he was considered to be a real rebel. But it was the poor that it was based on. I'm conscious that we I know, we need to open up to questions. I know, we need to open up to questions. I know, we do need to open up to questions. And um, I can't remember, have we got Roven Mike? Have we got a mic or mics? Yeah, we have, we have, we have. Just the one? We've certainly got one there. Yep. We've got one there. Oh, two, excellent. All right, well, we'll, get, we'll just throw it open. And if somebody sticks their hand up, we will get a microphone to you. They're all going, oh. oh for God. There you go, gentlemen at the front. They're going, oh. They're numb. They're <laughs> numb with all those stories. Um, is there any of Greek's personality before the biography? Is any, any of Rebus's, <laughs> any of me and him? Any of him and me? I mean, we've got similar kind of, we grew up in the same place. We grew up in Carden Den. Um, went to the same school to a certain extent. He left school at 15, joined the army, then joined the police. So that's the point at which it stops. And we've got the same taste in music, we drink in the same pub. He's a different generation from me. Uh, I think he's a much more of an Old Testament kind of guy. He would see me as being a wishy-washy liberal who's never had to do a hard day's work in his life and has been suckled by the state. Thank you very much, the state. Um, so we wouldn't really get on if we met. But at the same time, where do your characters come from? All your characters are aspects of your personality. So Rebus and Siobhan and Cafferty and Malcolm Fox, they're all coming from inside my head. They're not people that I know. But weirdly, I mean, a lot, a lot of cops, I've gone around the world and there's always a cop in the audience, or usually a cop in the audience, and at the end they come up and they go, I know a guy just like Rebus, or I used to work with a guy just like Rebus, mm. or you must have based him on this guy, and I go, I've never met that guy. I mean, even cops in Edinburgh say he must be based on so-and-so. Um, no, he just came from inside my head. And I didn't realise I was going to be sticking around with him quite this long. I've known him almost as long as I've known my wife. <laughs> Two life sentences in one. <laughs> She's not here. You can tell. I know, you can tell. So no, I mean, the answer to that is no. I don't think as much of me and him. But I like, I like the fact that he can say things I can't say. I mean, he's, he's you know, I'm, a, I'm quite safe in what I do in life, and he's a bit of a risk taker and a bit of a rebel and a bit of a maverick and all the rest of it. And he talks, he speaks back to authority in a way that I've never done. And he's always got a great comeback line. I'm like most people, I think of the great comeback line two, two days, days later. later. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else got a question? Uh, yes, along there, hang on, we'll get the microphone to you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what all crime fiction is about. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't know how you take it from there. Uh, I, uh, oh, that's really, really hard. God, what a good question. 
Um, I'm, I'm always viewed as being Pollyanna. My glass is usually always half full. Um, I like to believe that there is good in people. I am very fortunate that I don't think I have met, ever met anybody who is inherently evil. Um, I think you become a product of your background, your circumstances, your attitudes. Ev everybody is unique in that. Um, I like to think that there is a good in everybody and I like to think that it's our job to try and find that but I, unfortunately we're not always as good as we should be um, yes there are people out there um, some of the things that that we've seen that you think you know they must be inherently evil but I'll bet they were good to their mum <laughs> and I bet they liked their dog and I bet there was something about them that was still good if, if you lose hope in that little spark that there has to be something worth finding in everybody, then I think you lose hope. And that's, that's my glass half full. That um, was really hard. I, um, <laughs> I, I, years ago, I made a TV series on evil for Channel 4. It was actually Channel 4 religious programming. Who knew that Channel 4 had a head of religious programming? And we got funding and we did a three-part series. On e it was going to be a three-part series on crime. But when I started talking to the director, we just started bouncing around and going, we can't talk about crime without talking about what that actually means. And we got back to evil, good and evil. And it was three programmes, and the first programme said, what do we mean? What does that term mean? Does it mean anything? Does it mean the same things to different cultures at different times in history? Um, the second programme was, where does it come from? Nature or nurture? People born bad or made bad? Is it a chemical reaction? What is it? And I was talking to psychiatrists, psychoanalysts. I spoke to an exorcist. Um, about the devil, and I was actually exorcised, um, which was interesting. And um, I think it's weird enough about now. Um, and in program three, what do we do about it? You know, rehabilitation, incarceration. I interviewed a guy on death row in Texas. He'd been on death row for 12 years, just waiting for his appeals to run out, and then it was going to be the lethal injection. Mm. And at the end of that entire process, we, we looked at Lombroso, we looked at this, we looked at that. And at the end, end of that entire process, I, I was. I couldn't point to a person and say they were evil, but I could point to an action yeah. and say at that moment you committed an act of evil, which I think is kind of what you were saying. With one exception, and the one exception was Ian Brady. The director wanted me to interview Ian Brady's mum. So he'd contacted Ian Brady's mum. She had contacted Ian Brady and he said, no, if Ian Rankin wants to talk, he talks to me, not you. And the director was very excited about this and I was less excited. I said, there's no way I'm letting that guy get inside my head because once he's inside your head, he ain't leaving. But I did read a book he'd written called The Gates of Janus, which was an apologia for serial killers, mm. saying we should be in awe of serial killers because they're a higher form of life. And um, it's the only book I've ever read that I would gladly see burnt. Mm -hmm. um, so I came to a real understanding that there are maybe a few cases out there where you can say you can't be fixed. Yeah. You're unfixable and probably always were unfixable. Um, but very, very rare. Very rare, but it's a fascinating. I mean, this whole thing about why why we don't do why more of us don't do bad things is interesting. Um, even when we get the chance to do it, we don't. You know, we are all capable. We're social animals, all capable of good and all capable of evil. I think, and it's what stops us doing it that's fascinating. Anybody else? It's a gentleman at the back. Right at the back. Good. Make you run running. up the stairs. Yeah, she's wearing heels as well. Poor Patricia. Either or she, maybe she's just really tall. Uh, from time to time, we see facial reconstructions of long dead bodies and so on. Mm -hmm. I can understand how you can reconstruct uh, a person's appearance in terms of the thickness of the skin on the top of the head and what their ears probably were like. But how the heck do you differentiate between the person who has never knowingly walked past a plate of food and somebody who's emaciated? Um, when you reconstruct a face, un underneath the face is a skull and that skull in terms of the openings is what you're reconstructing. So you're reconstructing eyes, you're reconstructing nose, you're reconstructing mouth and you're reconstructing ears. So any opening that you have into your face is the thing that we're constructing around. And all of our faces, that's the bits that we look at. And our skull underneath does dictate how that looks. So the shape of our nose is very much reflected by the shape and size of the bones that are underneath. So there is an inherent face that we can reconstruct. What we can't know 
is whether you are 15 stone or 8 stone. And so when we reconstruct you, we can reconstruct you to a middle size. We don't reconstruct you generally with a skin colour, if it's certainly if, if all we have is, is skeletal remains. So you will see the facial reconstruction go out in black and white, it's a grey colour. The hair that we put on is going to be just a, a, a sort of fairly basic style. And all you're trying to do in a facial reconstruction is to jog somebody's memory, to say, you know, that looks a bit like Mrs Jones and I haven't seen her in three years. And when we put that face out, all the police are trying to do are get leads and then they will follow that up. Now, sometimes we can get incredibly clo close, frighteningly close, that it looks a bit like magic. But if we are far enough away, we never know whether the face we've reconstructed was a poor reconstruction or whether that person actually was never going to be found anyway. They might have been trafficked into the country, they might be here illegally. So we have a great difficulty identifying what our, our accuracy rate is, because when we get it right, we get it really right. But when we get it wrong, we can't always explain why it's wrong. But there's an inherent face underneath. And, and when you look at your own face, whether it's at the age it is now, or 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, and you look at your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters, there'll be a similarity in there. And that's the underlying bone structure and genetics. So all we're trying to do is just jog a memory, not make a perfect reconstruction. You. You're welcome, sir. Time for one or two more. If you're quick, yes, madam. Based on reading of detective novels, um, you get the impression that many more in the States than here, that there are some distinctly dubious expert witnesses, inverted commas, out there. What's your opinion of the quality we get in this country? What's your opinion, Sue, of the... Sue, what is your opinion of the quality of expert witnesses in this country? <sighs> God, it's like being back in court. Um, <laughs> in 2006, the National Academy of Sciences in America wrote a report on the state of forensic science. And by and large, it said it's the shoddiest science imaginable. And part of the reason for that is that there is very little funding for research in forensic science. So most of our forensic science is not fit for purpose. Probably the only bit of forensic science that passes a true admissibility test for court is DNA. But DNA is starting to be thrown out of court and starting to be questioned. So for example, we've now got so clever at extracting DNA, we can do it from a single cell. So now my DNA is on Ian. When Ian goes home tonight and murders his wife, then my DNA will be at that crime scene, but I was never there. And part of our difficulty is being able to explain contamination, explain transfer, and as a result of that, your expert has to be really good at things like statistics and mathematics and logical reasoning. And that's not the kind of things that often people think that, that is a, an inherent scientific need. So some of our experts are incredibly good, some of them are incredibly bad, and there's a few others that are going to sit perfectly in the middle, but they're dealing with a set of tools that by and large are not fit for purpose. And there's a huge amount of work needs to be done in terms of research. Now when you think at the end of the day that most juries um, find most court cases boring as anything, and the only thing that brightens it up is the prospect of a good forensic witness, then the importance of that science in court actually becomes exacerbated. And you have to be very careful that it doesn't become the showcase, because it isn't. We have to be realistic about it. So there's a, there's a move towards accrediting our experts that says we have to sit the exams now to prove that we're fit to go into court. Now, a lot of the old guard are, are kicking and screaming about that, that says, I've been doing this for 40 years. Why do I need to sit an exam? Yeah, but if you've been doing it bad for 40 years, then you do need to sit the exam. So, th so there is a there is a big there's a big wind of change coming in forensic science in, in this country. We certainly were viewed as being leaders in the world, and I, I use that as the UK. And then something tragic happened in the UK, and it happened in England and Wales, 
which was they shut down the Forensic Science Service in England and Wales, and all of forensic science went into commercial providers. Scotland and Northern Ireland were very, very sensible and they didn't do that. So we retained national labs. And we are, I think now Scotland and Northern Ireland are in fact probably leading the way over the rest of the UK at the moment and that's the way it should stay. I think England and Wales bitterly regrets the decision that they made, but it's not finished playing out yet. So the, there's, there's big problems in forensic science. Okay, last question. One last question. Yes, sir. Excellent. That was good. I enjoyed that answer. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> We've seen the sort of stepwise improvement in identification from fingerprints to DNA, and you mentioned vein patterns and um, facial reconstruction. What do you think is the main deficiency in forensic science at the moment? Otherwise, what's the next step going to be, do you think? Um, our biggest deficiency in forensic science is understanding. It's in mathematics and in statistics. So it's the likelihood and it's the probability ratios. And that, that's where we're weakest because we don't have the ground truth databases that allow us to test the methods. Um, fingerprints we've been using for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And fingerprints went without question until the fingerprint inquiry, um, which became the, the Scottish fingerprint inquiry in relation to Shirley McKee. And what that did was that downgraded fingerprints from evidence of fact to evidence of opinion. And what's important is that there is no forensic science that is immune. There is nothing that is the, the golden bullet that will solve everything. And it means that you actually need to use a multiple approach in terms of science. In, in identification, we, we tend to be following the biometrics industry because there's a huge amount of funding in biometrics. We're a, a, a community and a culture that is scared of our security. And in fact, one of the, the highest rising crimes in the UK is identity theft and identity fraud. So that we start to use our biometrics as a, a currency. So any of you who've got a mobile phone or a laptop that requires your fingerprint to gain access, please don't do that. You don't know where your fingerprint's going. You don't know where it's being stored. And if you give up your bit of your biometric as part of your identity, if I lose my credit cards, they can issue me with a new one and they can issue me with a new PIN number. You steal my fingerprint, you can't issue me with a new fingerprint. And so we're very, very blasé about giving up our identity because and teenagers are probably the worst for it. So that if you want the latest I whatever it is in terms of a phone or an electronic device, then to be able to access it, the companies are asking you to give up a biometric. Over my dead body will I give over a biometric into the biometrics industry when identity theft is the biggest rising crime in the country. There you go. So all those new phones you're getting for Christmas? No. I'm doing Just it. say I'm no. <laughs> um, we're going to wrap it up there. Um, Sue and I will be hanging around for a wee bit if anybody has got extra questions or wants to talk to us. Um, before we head off, but I want to thank you for coming out tonight. It's been an amazing session. I've really enjoyed it. I've learned a lot. Some of it might crop up in my next book. <laughs> and um, thank you for coming out. Thanks very much, Sue. Thank you. Very Sue. Much, thank you. So glad. Thank you. Okay.